hear the Word of God extensively, and we should, so as to get a better context. First of all, let's get something very clear right from the outset. This is not a, a message about President Trump and the Southern Wall. You know, although, Mr. President, if you ever do watch my videos, you might get some pointers. Um, but that's not what it's about. It's about spirituality and the battles that we face. We take the Word of God to see how we are dealing with our spiritual battles. I was reading about this woman who <clears throat> had telephoned her friend and asked her how she was doing. And the woman replied, terrible. My head splitting. My back and legs are killing me. The house is a mess. And the kids are simply driving me crazy. Very sympathetically, the caller replied, Listen, go and lie down. I'll come over right away and cook lunch for you. Clean up the house and take care of the children where you get some rest. By the way, how is Sam? Sam, the complaining housewife, gasped. I have no husband named Sam. Oh, my heavens, exclaimed the first woman. I must have dialed the wrong number. There's a pause, silence. And this, the, the fatigued housewife said, are you still coming over? Certainly all of us understand that frustration, that, 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 that sense of like we're so exhausted, we're working so hard, and to hear any kind of relief coming to help us, we're like, yes, we welcome any relief whatsoever. Well, that's how Nehemiah is, de is dealing with. If you've never read the book of Nehemiah, you should. It's a great book. Actually, for me, it's become a book that's become attached to me because it was the first message I preached when I became pastor of this church back in 1998. And it was on Nehemiah, the importance of working together to rebuild the wall. But certainly, when you begin to work hard, and you want to do the work of God, you must be ready for exhaustion. You must be ready for opposition. Nehemiah has no illusions about this. You know, if we're living as a church, as the body of Christ, if we're living a lukewarm life, if we're really not concerned... <laughs> about being on fire for God and doing the things God wants to do, we don't have to worry. The enemy is not going to disturb us. He's not going to bother us. But if we find disturbance, we find things being made difficult for us as we're trying to do the work of the church, as we're trying to do the work of the body of Christ, and we see people opposing us and trying to stop the work that we're doing, praise God. Praise God. Because it shows that we're not lukewarm, that we're listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, that we're being obedient. And we should move forward. The same goes for your own personal life. It's not only for the life of the church. In your own personal life. Again, if you, were, if you were compromising with the world, if you were not really on fire for God, the enemy's not going to bother you. You're going to have a very peaceful life. You can go sit there by the, by the beach and everything's going to be wonderful. But if you want to serve God, if you want to be faithful, if you want to accomplish in your life what He has for you, then you must be ready opposition. But the enemy doesn't care, of course, if we meet here and we read our Bibles and we pray and we do our kumbaya and he doesn't care as long as we are not transformed. As long as we're not changed. If you can come into this place and walk out the same way and come in again and walk out the same way, he's not going to bother you at all. But if you're coming into this place to hear the Word of God and to be transformed by the Spirit of God, then you must be ready for opposition. The enemy will attack you. The enemy will make it difficult for you. And Nehemiah has been set on this mission. God has given him a call, has given him a mission to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And as soon as he goes back and he gets all the families involved in doing the work, no sooner has he gotten it started that an enemy arises, enemies arise to try to stop the work that he's doing. Actually, chapter 4 to chapter 6, which I thought, should I preach a second sermon on the many ways that the enemy attacks us? No, I'm not going to go through all of them. But you can certainly go on your own and see it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop, and I'll allude to some of them. But we're going to focus here on chapter 4. And we have to understand, of course, that when these things happen, God is permitting it. And God will use it to strengthen us to move us forward, to expose the things that need to be exposed and teach us how to move forward in doing the things that He wants us to do. But the lesson that we learn here in chapter 4 is indeed knowing our enemy. Knowing our enemy and knowing the tactics of our enemy. Now, I'm not here preaching the art of war, but that's the first thing Sun Tzu tells you. One of the things Sun Tzu tells you is know your enemy. 
and all tactics your enemy uses so you can confront them. Well, the Bible agrees with that. The Bible says we need to know our enemy and we need to know how the enemy is going to come and attack us. And there are multiple ways that he does. Today we're going to deal with some of them. And the first thing we see is that when the enemy attacks us, the, this evil enemy that we have fighting against the work of God, one thing that we see is that he works through people. That he works through people who will seek to undermine the work that we're doing and seek to ridicule what we're doing. See the anger being expressed against Nehemiah and the things that he's trying to do and the ridicule against the people of Israel and what they're trying to accomplish is trying to build up the wall. We see in verse 1, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. In verse 7, but when Sanballat, the Arabs and the Ammonites and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. Some ballot doesn't want the Jewish people to rebuild the wall. He doesn't want them to be strong. Because he realized that if they become strong, then he becomes weak. It minimizes his strength and his influence in that place. You know, there are people who want to make sure that the church doesn't grow. That the church doesn't move forward. That the church can be stayed at a minimal and they're actually working against the church. And it's not only outside forces. The Bible tells us that even within the church, Paul warned the, the congregation in Acts chapter 20, when he's leaving Ephesus, be careful, because even among your number will rise up those who will seek to devour each other and devour the church. People want to make the church weaker so that it cannot accomplish the work that God has given to us. That's why we have to be so mindful of the enemy. We have to be so mindful of the tactics of the enemy. The enemy does not want us to succeed. Period. Again, if we're willing to sit back and do nothing, and sit back and you know, sit around a campfire and do come kumbaya, write beautiful songs, because our, our generation is great at writing beautiful songs, and we're good, very good at preaching very nice sermons, and we're, we're very, even very good at writing nice books and having nice seminars. My goodness, we have more church now than ever before. When I was a young Christian, there was no such thing. Forget about it. There was not. Christian music was like lame <laughs> compared to what Christian music is now. We were like, you know, we were glad that we had like Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant. <laughs> but we didn't have this variety of Christian music. All these speakers, all these seminars, all these retreats. We didn't have this. Now we have all this. Has the church become stronger? No. Again, if we're doing all this, but there's no transformation, he doesn't care. Because it makes us weaker. And that's all he's concerned about. Interesting enough, we see that even in this passage, when an enemy is opposing us and seeking to stop the work that we're doing as a church, or even trying to stop us in our own personal life for the things that God wants for us, they're even willing to become friends with their enemies. Now, you don't know because of the historical background, but these people, the Ammonites, the Arabs, Sambalat, Tobiah, they're enemies. They're not friends with each other. They hate each other. And now because they see Israel standing up and wanting to rebuild the, the, the walls and do the work of God, now they're combining their forces together. You know, the older expression, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Although I remember hearing in a movie once, and I thought it was very good, said... <laughs> The enemy of my enemy is not necessarily my friend. Uh, but this is their mindset. They're willing to put aside their differences in order to destroy the work of God. In order to destroy Nehemiah and all that he is doing. Isn't that amazing? How sometimes the people of God have such a hard time uniting. But when the enemy wants to destroy us, he has no problem uniting. And people that hate each other. People that were against each other. People that were, you know, trying to fight and destroy each other, stop. And they unite in harmonious fellowship to hurt you, to stop you. That's amazing. You know, it just, I don't know, for me it just warms my heart when you can imagine that people can do that. Doesn't it warm your heart when you see people, like two people that maybe dislike you so much and they disliked each other, but just because of you, they become bonded. You know, like Pilate. Pilate couldn't stand Caesar, and Caesar couldn't stand Pilate, but Pilate had Jesus killed, and they became buddies. 
It's amazing how the enemy works. And we have to be aware of this. That again, when we have enemies and we're trying to do the work of God, we're trying to grow for the Lord, we're trying to move forward, the enemy is going to unite against us. And they're going to become buddies, even though they were enemies, to hurt us, to stop the work. And one of the ways they do it, of course, is through ridicule. To ridicule. The British critic and author Thomas Carlyle called ridicule the language of the devil. Ridicule is amazing. You know, you start, you start doing some project, you start doing some work. Have you ever been, ever been working on anything? And you're, you're so enthusiastic, you're on fire, man, I can't wait, this project, awesome. Someone comes around and says, well, that looks stupid. Wow. Just like that. Push. <laughs> they seek to deflate you in five seconds, no matter what you're doing. It could be your garden, it could be whatever. Someone just comes around and they critique it. They want to bring it down. They want to destroy you. They want to make sure that, oh my goodness. And you have to have a thick skin. If you're going to serve the Lord, if you're going to do what God wants you to do for your life, you better acquire a thick skin. Because people are going to come around and they're going to judge you. And they're going to say, oh my goodness, that's not big enough. That's not good enough. Like it says here, you know, oh, that wall is so flimsy. If a fox lands on that wall, it will fall apart. They will mock the work that you're doing. And you have to be steadfast. You have to know that this occurs. And then, of course, ridicule doesn't simply come from one person. Ridicule is a team sport. It's bad, in, you know, usually when you have one person who comes and mocks you, makes fun of you. Isn't it funny how so the, there's a chorus that begins? All of a sudden, now there's more people judging you and saying, oh my goodness, this is horrible. Why are you dreaming? Why are you imagining you can accomplish this? And I tell people, you know, there was a time when we were dreamers, right? When we were young people, we were dreamers. We believed. We set out to accomplish things that people said was impossible. But then someone came and told us we couldn't do it. (coughs) They said it couldn't be done. They said to give up. And we gave up. We compromised. We gave up on the things that God had placed within our hearts. The dreams that he had for us. Certainly that happens individually. It happens to us. As a church. And we have to be aware of the way the enemy attacks. And again, know, even when the enemy is attacking you, and is trying to put you down, and say you are nothing, that you are worthless, that you will not be able to accomplish this, your mindset should be, no problem. Your mind should be, yes, you're right. I am worthless. This all is weak. But you have to know where your resources are. Listen to what they say to him. Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Which they, will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? First of all, we have to realize that ultimately, when someone is mocking the work that we're doing for Christ and the work that we're doing for God, they're mocking Christ. They're mocking God. If you're seeking to destroy the work of the church, you're fighting against God. Good luck. Good luck on that one. You know, just like the Bible says, you might find yourself that when you think you're battling me or you're battling us, you're battling God. And you're bringing destruction to yourself. But they're mocking God, ultimately. And when people come to us and they want to bring us down, let it be. Don't be insulted by their insults. You look at me, you look at the work I'm doing, and you say I'm a moron. I am a moron. I am an idiot. I am worthless. But the God who lives in me, He is powerful, and He is brilliant, and He is resourceful. We need to remember who empowers us. It's not us. You see, that's part of where the enemy is able to get us. When he begins to convince us that somehow it's us. Somehow it's because, oh, I'm so smart. You know, not for nothing, I know there's some of you out there who, who are strong. I know some of you out there who are naturally brilliant. I do thank the Lord that I'm not. I do thank the Lord that when I came to Him, I had nothing to offer. Absolutely nada. I was, I was naked and poor and blind, as the hymn says. And there was nothing to offer Him. But I praise God for that. Because I cannot glory, cannot offend me. Because I'm fully aware that it's God. Look at this beautiful scripture, in case you forget. Now again, not everyone's like that. Even the scripture says it. But look, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not not many were noble birth. 
But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Now, not many. I remember one lady who, who commented this once. And see, I, she, I remember reading a book about her. She was a wealthy woman. And she always gloried, thanks, she always loved those words, and not many. <laughs> because she, she actually was rich and she knew the Lord. She said, I'm one of the rich ones who do know the Lord. <laughs> you know? But not many of us were. We were nothings. First of all, the enemy didn't think twice about us to begin with. But now that we're seeking to do the work of the Lord, now he's focused on us. And he's working on criticizing us, bringing us down. Let me tell you this much. One thing to keep in mind. Critics don't work. They don't. Critics just criticize. That's like when you see people, uh, they're always criticizing others. I, I, you, stop. You know? I get to sit back and critique music. You know? Musicians write songs, they do all this stuff, and I get to say, that was lousy. Even though I've never written a song myself. <laughs> even though I don't, I don't even play an instrument that well. I can sit back and go, that was lousy. <laughs> you know? Critics don't work. Critics don't work. Always remember that. That's part of the humor you should, step, you should take back on, on people that are criticizing. They're not doing work. Their only work is to try to bring down those who are doing work. The enemy is trying to destroy you. And so he's angry at the work that you're doing. He's angry at the fact that you are being transformed by the Holy Spirit. He wants to stop you. He wants to stop the work of the church. And of course, when the ridicule doesn't help, then he tries threatening Threatens, threats and intimidation. Look at verse 7 8. But when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the people of Ashtar heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. Now that's frightening. When you're this group of people called the Israelites, and you're small, even today we know that Israel is always concerned about that, that they have enemies all around them. And that's exactly what they are. It's not merely, oh, we have some ballot in the north. No, you have to buy it in the, in the south. And you have the Ammonites, and you have the Ashdots, and you have all these people around you, threatening you. No, you won't stop. You won't listen to our ridicule. Okay, we're going to take it to the next level. Now, the amazing thing is, of course, that the king is behind Nehemiah. The king allowed Nehemiah to do the work he's doing. So he's been commissioned by the king himself. We know that God is behind us, and God is working through us, and God is given his job. And yet, when we are threatened, we fear. We fear. We're afraid what the enemy will do with us, what the enemy will do to us. You know, sometimes the threat is greater than even the actual thing. You know, when someone makes you fear that they're going to harm you, think about it. All of a sudden, that thought dominates you. They don't have to even come hurt you. They don't have to come hit you. They don't have to come to your house. They don't have to burn you. They don't have to do anything. They've already put fear in your heart. You're already concerned. You're already thinking it cannot be done. And you begin to back away. The temptation to move away because, oh my goodness, I'm afraid of what can happen. And this happens everywhere for Christians. Think about it. You're working for a boss who's dishonest and begins to do even more dishonest things. But then he wants to implicate you in his dishonesty. He wants you to do what he wants you to do and you know that it's wrong. And now he makes you fearful that if you don't do what he wants you to do, you will be out of a job. And you begin to fear about, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Trust God. That God will provide for you. Has not God provided for you so far? He will provide for you. But it's that fear that causes us to compromise. It's also fear when you're in a, in a school. I remember being in school, of course, all the years I was there. And now, of course, I'm sure it's gotten worse. And you have teachers that are atheists. And oh my goodness, God forbid you write a paper defending God. Or going against the professor. You know, I, I'm very ashamed of professors today. Because this, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Professors say basically want you to agree with them. Blah, blah back. That's not education by any standards. Education is to have you think for yourself even if your thoughts are different from mine. That's education. Now I'm getting educational too. But 
I'm not here to give a policy, but you know it's true. Education should be that I make you think. Even uh, Luke Wick, Wittgenstein, I love when he said that. He said, I am helping people to think, even though I know they might not think thoughts, the same thoughts that I'm thinking. I want them to think. We need to think. We need to grow. And I guess you're in there with a professor and you feel, again, do I compromise? You know, it's even more incredible when it happens in churches. I remember years ago being in a church where the pastor had committed adultery. And the deacons knew about it. And they kept it quiet. They kept it silent to control the pastor. Because they wanted to control. And they did control him for many years. He compromised his integrity. He compromised his ministry because they threatened him. And he fell for their threat. You know, if someone threatens me like that, I'm like, bring it on. Let's bring it to the church then. Let's bring it out there. But you're not going to threaten me and somehow try to manipulate me. And that's exactly what they did to him. They manipulated him. So the horrors of these things not simply happens in the workplace or in school. It happens in our very churches, in our very congregation, where people are compromising their morality because they want to be able to continue doing what they're doing. Now, of course, not all compromising is bad. Some compromising is good. I'm not here saying, oh, don't ever compromise under any circumstances. Obviously, compromise is a good thing in marriage. Amen? Amen? Good. It's just, I want to hear men and women here. Uh, yeah, because sometimes you're in a situation, you have to say, hey, compromise. This is, not, you know, this is not important. You know, we're battling over, over dumb things. Compromise is good. Compromise is obviously good in the church also, right? Amen? <clears throat> Amen. We have to. There are times when we need to compromise. But we cannot compromise when it comes to our morality, when it comes to our integrity. And aligning ourselves with people who don't have that sense of morality and integrity. Think about these individuals who are posing Nehemiah. Eventually they're going to want to become his friends too. Because that's another tactic of the enemy. I'm going to kill you, I'm going to beat you, uh, I can't beat you, I can't kill you. Hey, can I become your friend? <laughs> Say what? <laughs> and they will, they'll... Tr- but how can you become friends with people who don't have moral integrity? Who are not really people who are like-minded and don't have the same fear of God that you do. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and following, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Baal? Or what does a believer have in common with unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. There are places and times when we cannot compromise. There are people that we can build alliances with. When you have people who are dishonest, people who are are, are godless, who have no sense of the Lord, have no sense of morality, you cannot align yourself with them. And if you do, if you make that compromise, oh my goodness, they're going to take you down. You're not going to bring them up. They're not going to become like you. You're going to become like them. Before you know it, you're going to be compromising and you're going to be, you know, uh, cutting corners and doing all these things to do what they want rather than do what you want. So, of course, this is one of the ways that the enemy works. Another way is to just completely discourage us. Look at verse 10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. And there's so much rubble that we cannot build the wall. You know, now it's not only that we're afraid of the enemy. Come on, let's just be honest. They're right. We can't get this work done. You know, it's never going to, we're never going to be able to get it done. We're never going to be finished. You know, why are we even trying? Let's just give up. And oh my goodness, every, once that goes out, I mean, think about it. Discouragement is contagious also. As soon as one person is discouraged, they, 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 eh, you know, I think John is right. I think we should just abandon this whole thing. It's not, it's not you know, and before you know it, Peter's gone agreeing with them and everybody's agreeing with Let's give this up. Remember the people of Israel when they were going to go into a promised land? God said, go look at the land, and I'm going to give you the land. The land is yours. I'm telling you the land is yours. Go get it. But they go in to spy the land, and 10 of the spies come back, and they give a negative report. There were 12 spies. 10 say, no, it's horrible. It's horrible. There are big people there. Huge. (laughs) We look look like very small compared to them. Everything is so, oh yeah, the, the, the land is beautiful. The vegetation is awesome, but they're giants. They're going to crush us. And only two said, no, God said, let's go get it. Let's go get it. But the discouragement of the ten won over. And here's amazing because we see the people of Judah. The people of Judah. 
the line of the great king, David. They are the ones who are bringing discouragement and saying, no, let's give up. You know, Sam Ballin and Tobiah are right. Let's all give up in here. We cannot do this work. Let's shut this down. That's amazing. Why would the people of Judah, the great line of Judah, compromise and think that it can't be done and be discouraged? Well, we find out in chapter 6 that they are related to Tobiah by marriage. They are related to Tobiah, and so they're willing to compromise because of their blood. Sometimes blood is thicker than water. And here, because they are blood-related to them, they're willing to compromise the work of God. And they're willing to discourage the work of God and say it can be done because, again, their alliance is not with the people of God. We have to be careful. Who are we aligned with? Are we the people of God? Do we align ourselves with people of God? I mean, sometimes we do it in word. But do we do it in deed? Remember Jesus when they came to him and said, Oh, your mother and your sisters and your brothers are outside. What did he say? Who is my mother? <gasps> he said that about Mary. <laughs> well, like, Mary. It's like, you today I'd be like, oh, if I said that, right? If I said that, I'd be like, he just insulted Mary. Blasphema. You know, who is she? Who is my mother? Who is my sister? Who is my brother? I'll tell you who. The one who does the will of God. That's Jesus. That's our model. He doesn't put his physical, biological family above the real family, which is the people of God. And he tells us, in Matthew 10, verse 37, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. The people of Judah put their bloodline above the work of God and sought to discourage. They lacked the faith to be faithful to the things of the Lord. Now, of course, I can go on about all things that are wrong, all things that the enemy does, but I want to take this time now to come to how do we battle it? How do we respond as the people of God? Look at verses 4 and 5. The first way is by prayer. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. In verse 9, But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. The first thing is prayer. If you read through the book of Nehemiah, he will impress you as a man of prayer. He doesn't pray again after the fact. He always prays before the fact. Before he occurs, before he decides what he's going to do, first he prays. And here he says, God, deal with our enemies. And we say, oh no, we can't do that. Yes, we can. Because remember, they're not opposing Nehemiah. They're not opposing the people of Israel. They're opposing God. This is not a personal vendetta. This is not vengeance. This is not what it's promoting. The Bible does not promote that to say, Oh, God, you work for me, God. Kill her. <laughs> no, God doesn't do that. God would be like, say what? <laughs> Who are you talking to? <laughs> you know? God doesn't do that. But we say, God, they're insulting you, God. They're insulting you. Take care of it. God, they're trying to destroy the work of your church. Stop them. God, they're trying to destroy the work that you're trying to do in my life as a believer. They're trying to stop me from growing in your grace and your knowledge and your things. Please, God, intervene. You know, when you insult the people of God, you insult God. When you attack the people of God, you attack God. You know, when I see these nations that are persecuting Christians, I feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for them. Just like I feel sorry when I'm sure when, when Paul may, met, met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Here you are killing Christians. And God says, why are you persecuting me? I, he must have been pet I would have been petrified. I would have said, I'm dead. He's going to kill me. 
God will take care of it. As Paul says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. So the first thing we need to do is pray. And don't be afraid of praying a prayer that sounds like, oh no, uh, you know, Max Lucado would not approve that prayer. <laughs> it's not loving and sweet and kind. No, if, if it's something is wrong, it's wrong. God, stop that. I do pray that way. Because I want the work of the church to succeed. And if someone's standing in the way, I'm praying against them. And I don't feel bad I know I'm praying against an enemy of God. They're trying to destroy the work of God. If I see someone trying to destroy, if I see someone trying to destroy you in your Christian life, I'm praying against that person. God, put a hedge around them. Keep them far away from that person. Don't let them harm them. Because I'm concerned about your spirituality. This is important to pray this way, but prayer is so important. Secondly, work harder. Look at verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half the height, for the people worked with all their heart. When the enemy threatens you and says they're going to harm you, work harder. Don't let the enemy discourage you. Don't let the enemy make you give up. Fight harder. Work harder. As a church, we need to do that. When we see the enemy in any way threatening the church, we need to stand up. When we see the enemy, and I don't care in what way the enemy works, when we see the enemy attacking any church, we as the people of God need to stand up and say, no way. That's our brother. That's our sister. We stand with them. It's wrong. The church has to stand up. We have to work harder. Also in our personal lives. The enemy is trying to stop you. He's trying so hard. Sometimes he doesn't have to. If you're, if you're giving up, if you're lukewarm, he doesn't have to. But if you're working hard, he's going to try harder to stop you. Don't give up. On the contrary, he pushes, push back harder. Do even more work for the Lord. Thirdly, confront the enemy, of course. And Oh, this is for me, I'm sorry. <laughs> there is a, you do have to confront the enemy. And certainly, spiritually, we confront the enemy. That's part of the job of the pastor. The pastor says, uh, in Titus 1.9, says, He must hold firmly to a trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. There's nothing wrong in opposing those who are wrong. That is part of the work that we do. You know, interesting enough, you know, so many times we talk about uh, how we are to live the Christian life. And we see here, that here they are. They're praying, they're working with one hand, and they got a weapon in the other. So I love when people say, oh no, you know, as a church, we love Jesus. We trust the Lord. So we're going to keep all our doors open. You know, no. I see the evil in the world. And everybody who comes to this church knows that all our doors, except for that one right there in the back, are locked. Because our children are downstairs. We're not called to be naive as the people of God. And say, well, the Lord will take care of us. Yeah? Doesn't mean you're going to leave your, you know, when I see people saying, oh, leave things unlocked. You're gonna, do you leave your house unlocked at night? If you do, don't tell anybody. No. We have to take precautions. We need to defend the things that God has called us to defend. We have to protect our children. Protect them certainly physically. We protect our, their minds as well. That's why we're educating. That's why we make sure the things of this world do not infiltrate their minds. And that we're teaching them godly things. We need to make sure that we do all these things. That we are vigilant. Remain vigilant in the things that God has given to us. No matter what the enemy is doing, no matter how the enemy is opposing us, we have to be vigilant. We have to be resourceful. We have to know what to do. Again, if the enemy is trying to attack you, you have to know what to do. And there might be cases where you have to get yourself out of that situation. Or know how to respond in that situation. But be very careful. Finally, always keep your mind focused on God. Look at verse 14, how beautiful this is. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people... Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Our God is a great God, an awesome God. And when the enemy is trying to bring us down and to harm us and destroy us and stop the work that we're trying to do, focus on the God that we know. 
You know, that's why I love that verse. When people, you know, get into the, oh, the demonic. and this. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. Amen. Don't fear what they fear. Because God is with us. We need to stay focused. Yes, pray. Work harder. Be vigilant. And remember your God. Remember the God who commissioned you, who called you, who gave you that ministry, who gave you that work, who gave us this call, this church. Certainly the people before us did not forget. We can't forget either. And we certainly should not forget our past, the great history of this church, of all the great men and women who have worked so hard to move forward. How shameful it would be for us to be the generation that gives up. Now whether the generation is going to push further and do much more than they had dreamed of. Because our God is a great and awesome God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, in teaching us to be alert to the enemy and the ways of the enemy. Help us, dear God, to have the same mindset as Nehemiah. To understand the calling given to us as a church the calling you've given to us as individual and the work that you've called us to do. And Father, to be diligent, to move forward, to not be afraid of the enemies that arise to try to stop the work of your church. And Father, we pray that you will stop them, that you will bring them to an end, that you will rightfully, justly judge them for the evil that they're doing against your people, and that you will stop their work, dear God, and that your people will flourish here and everywhere where your name is called. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand and sing hymn number 195. It's hymn number 195. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the peace and fellowship of His Holy Spirit go with us until we meet again. Amen.